Final Fantasy VIII is a game that has often been noted for its story, and what some perceive as its narrative complexity or ambiguity, and this is something that has re-emerged in recent years, owing largely to creator Yoshinori Katase stating in a series of interviews that a bunch of content was cut from the game, and that, for example, the flashback sequences featuring Laguna Loire were originally meant to equate to about 50% of the story alongside Squall Leonhardt's story. This revelation has piqued the interest of many fans as to what the Laguna plus Squall story might have looked like, alongside what more might have been cut from the game. And what's fortunate is that increasingly a bunch of material has become available that hints to some degree or another as to what shape this game might have taken. So here we're going to look back over some of the available bits from Ultimania source material, interviews and code debugs to see what's up with the cut content of Final Fantasy VIII. Kicking off first with a world map that has been adapted and translated from Katase's own production notes, this is a pretty interesting document that, for the most part, represents the map as we know it in the finished Final Fantasy VIII, but with several key additions and adaptations. Moving from the top down, we have the northern continent of Trabia, which is one of the sparsest locations in the finished game, featuring only a bombed out Trabia garden and Shumi village for us to explore. Unlike the other major areas of Esthar and Galbadia, for example, Trabia has no featured capital or cultural centre in the game, which seems a little bit odd, and looking to Katase's map, it appears to have been one of the locations that was cut in the final game, since there is a capital city there, situated just north of Balam Island. Likewise, on the other side of Trabia Garden, we have another scrapped location, which was called Master Village in this draft, which may well have been repackaged as the northerly Shumi Village by the time the final game rolls around, since the Shumi Village is absent in this original map. Moving down the map, we have Balam Island, which is pretty much intact, but it has been annotated as the Balam Regency in Katase's notes, which is interesting because where we have the Galbadian Republic and the Dolit Dukedom, in the final game there's no real political attribution or obvious leadership to Balam and other areas like this, and a regency in particular is interesting because this would infer the existence or the prior existence of a monarchy at some point in time. But the real meat of the original narrative intentions comes, I think, from the Esthar region in this map, and to a lesser extent, the Centra region. And here we can see how much the Laguna segments would have trodden the path for Squall's future events to follow in, and how much more context may have been offered to historic outliers, such as Sorceress Adil, the Sorceress War, the White Seed, and so on. Since tracing down the map through Esthar, we have annotations for the Laguna era Luna Cry, which is only sparsely shown at the end of the fourth dream in the final game, and south of this we have a note that says this is where Esthar attacks Trabia, which would have expanded on the historical enmity between these two nations, and perhaps Laguna's role in, in witnessing that. We also have an airship origin point in what is now the Grandini Forest in the final game, and this has no significance in the finished game aside from being a place to find Marlboros, um, but it's interesting that perhaps the airship was originally meant to be discovered uh, on the world map rather than up in space. And further down from here we have what's noted as an old Esther capital and a new Esther capital, which is what it seems we got in the, in the final game, the latter one. Along with several notes about Adol descending to Earth, a white ship rendezvous point, and notes about existing locations such as a Sorceress Memorial, but this one is specific to the Laguna era. So, at a glance, what do we make of all of this? Uh, firstly, I think it alludes mostly to the Sorceress War era and Adol's reign, which is only hinted at in the final game and, and Laguna's role in that. We have Esthar attacking Trabia, which would likely have only occurred during her leadership. We have what's called the Adia White Seed Ship Rendezvous Point in the bottom right of the Esther region, which I think would relate perhaps to Adia and the White Seed rescuing alone in Laguna's era for the first time. And 
taking her to the orphanage perhaps, and this provokes a fascinating prospect for a thread of story or dialogue about Laguna and Idea's relationship, uh, synchronising their efforts or something. And then we have the note of Esther's old capital, so there's questions around whether this would have been Adol's seat of power prior to the super high-tech one that we find in the final game. In keeping with the map for a bit, and, and the Laguna era, we have the Galbadia region, and here we have a location called Flower City, which is probably an early note or draft about Windhill, since this is located exactly where Windhill is in the final game. We also have a Laguna escape point annotated on the coast by Windhill, so this is perhaps a segment where we may have seen him washed up in his escape from the Centra or something like that. And moving away from the map just briefly, there is evidence of the Windhill era of Laguna's story making it into production before being cut. Since we have pre-rendered backgrounds that weren't used in the final game, we have a distinctive green car featured that wasn't used in the final game, and there's also versions of the Windhill Mansion all smashed up, and the evidence of how this is used leads to the impression that Laguna may have crashed this car into the Windhill Mansion, uh, and some code investigators have found some dialogue with people complaining to him about that. Interestingly, we also have Boolean values in the code which toggle on or off Ward and Kiros in Windhill, so this may allude to an abandoned variable where ward can be obtained in the story, and likewise, and perhaps more interestingly, there are variables where Laguna's party, along with Adia, can be present in the Dolit uh, screens as well. So this shows, perhaps, the extent to which past events with Laguna may have spread around the world and gone to the same locations as Squall. He may have even had his own world map exploration to himself, and his arc may have overlapped with Adir and other characters from the past a little bit more. So, very interesting stuff there. The final bit I'd like to cover, without labouring on every intricacy, is the annotations of the central region, called uh, Lighthouse from Squall and Cypher's Memories, and this is where the orphanage is. Now, this is fascinating for a few reasons. Firstly, it says Squall and Cypher's Memories, not Squall and the Party or Squall and the Orphans. It hints, perhaps, that the entire collective orphan angle may not have been a thing in the original draft. Perhaps it would have been a more motley team of Final Fantasy characters from different locations, or at least different gardens in the finished game. And what it does do is focus specifically on a connection, or at least a relationship, and history between Squall and Cypher. Now, Cypher is an important secondary character in Final Fantasy VIII proper, but many, including myself, feel that there was a lot more going on with him that wasn't fully shown or realised in the final game. His kinship and vendetta with Squall, his relationship to Rhinoa, the sorceress knight angle, it seems like his connection to Squall may have originally been dialed up in an original draft to become something more emotively and historically connected. If they both recalled this lighthouse sequence which became Adia's orphanage, would this mean that they had some deeper level of conversation? Would it mean perhaps that we got internal monologues or flashbacks from Cypher as well as Squall? There's a lot that could have been unpacked here, which would have offered some great dynamism between the two characters, which was touched on but never fully fulfilled in the finished game. So there we have it, a brief high-level view of some of the interviews, map notes and debugged data that hints at what Final Fantasy VIII might have been if they'd retained the fuller story up into release. Indeed, the notes provided hints that the dream sequences, and certainly the party all coming from the same place, may not have even been on the cards in the original draft, and those who regard Irvine's basketball court monologue at Trabia, where he reveals all these collective memories, as an extremely hammy piece of writing, they may well have picked up on a point where Katase and Najima were trying to square the circle of a heavily redacted and adapted, but otherwise cohesive story. All said, Final Fantasy VIII remains one of the most intriguing stories in the Final Fantasy anthology, and those calling for the ever unlikely remake, I think, do so in part because they can see the potential to explore what was lost in the abridged Laguna arc in Katase's original vision.